We'll go ahead. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Evaluate's March webinar, What Right Sizing Evaluation for ATE Small Grants. This webinar is brought to you by Evaluate, the ATE Evaluation Resource Center at Western Michigan University, which is sponsored by the National Science Foundation. I'm Kristen Martens, and I'll be the moderator for today's webinar. With me here at Western Michigan University in Kalamazoo, Michigan, is Lori Wingate, the Director of Evaluate. And also joining us today from Mentor Connect is Elaine Kraft and Dennis Faber. Behind the scenes, making sure this webinar runs smoothly, we have Mike Lisecki from Maytech at Maricopa Community Colleges. To help keep track of who's speaking at different times during the presentation, the presenter's picture and name can be seen in the upper right corner of most of the slides. Please note that the views expressed in this webinar are those of the presenters and do not necessarily reflect those of the National Science Foundation. For those of you who are not affiliated with the ATE program, ATE stands for Advanced Technological Education. It's an NSF program focused on improving technician education in fields like biotechnology, advanced manufacturing, nanotechnology, renewable energy, and others. So when you hear or read ATE, that's what we're referring to. It is our intent that by the end of this webinar, you will know the requirements and expectations for evaluation of ATE small grants, and that you will know how to maximize resources so that evaluation brings value to your small project. To orient you to the structure of today's webinar, you can see that we are in the midst of introductions and housekeeping, as it's highlighted in orange. The webinar then has four main sections. Dennis and Elaine will lead the first section, providing an introduction to ATE funding. And Lori will lead the next three sections, focusing on evaluation in ATE and specifically for small projects. After each section, we will stop for question breaks. We will conclude with closing remarks, resources, reminders about coming events, and very importantly, a chance for you to give us your feedback through an online survey, which will be available immediately following the presentation. So let's finish up with the housekeeping with a brief orientation to our webinar system. This webinar is presented through Blackboard, and it's clear by the raising of some hands that, you've, um, that many of you are already familiar with Blackboard functions. But for those of you who are new to our webinar system, this is a screenshot of what you should see on the far left of your screen. And you can notice that there's a hand icon here. To raise your hand, you just click on the icon, which may need, you may need to do later into the webinar. Just below, you will find the participants box. And this box lists everyone who is attending the webinar. At the bottom left is the chat box, where you can type questions and comments that you would like the presenters to address. You can do this at any time, as I'll be keeping track of these submissions so that we can then address them at the scheduled question and answer breaks that follow each section of the webinar. To ensure that everyone can follow the chat conversation, which we really encourage everyone to participate in, be sure that the Room tab is selected. This tab is located below the chat box to the far left. So let's practice using the Room chat box now. So in the chat box, please type the name of the organization you are from and how many people are viewing this webinar in the room with you. Okay. okay, and those entries are coming in. Thank you. The webinar slides are available on our website right now, and this webinar is being recorded. We will email you the link for the recording when it's available, which usually takes one to two days. Please note that when you view a recording of this webinar, you will not see the chat box conversations. When we send you the link to the webinar recording, we will also send you a link for an accompanying handout that outlines other helpful resources. Mike, could you please give everyone access to the marker tool? And to find the marker tool, look to the right of the participants box. And you should see a little pencil icon that looks like, the, that looks like this. So select that, and you'll be able to mark on the screen. Oh, somebody's already trying it. OK, so hold your markers a minute. And here we go. I would like you to try to draw a fish in the bowl. Oh, some nice ones.
some have just fins. Lovely artwork. Thank you very much. Okay, keep your marker ready for the next slide. Here we go. We're going to move on. All right. Please use your marker tool to tell us a little bit more about yourself or your team by placing a mark in the cell that best fits you. If none of the cells fit your circumstance, then go ahead and click the icon to raise your hand. If you raise your hand because it really doesn't fit you, none of the cells do, then maybe you can just type in the chat box what you are hoping to get out of this webinar. So it looks like predominantly we have people that are applying for their first ATE grant this fall. Um, and they're going to be small grants, right. And there are quite a few that already have a grant, but they're a little bit larger. They're larger than 200000 So that's going to be helpful for our presenters um, as they, they move on into the webinar. And let's go ahead and turn things over to Dennis, who will start us out into our webinar content. Thank you. Uh, and thanks for your response to the poll questions. Uh, we hope those will help us rate size our comments to your needs. Uh, I'm going to present a, a little bit of overview of the ATE program and its specifics to ensure that we're all starting the session with the same background information. Uh, as you can see from the slides, the focus for the AT program is on technician education at the post-secondary and secondary levels for high technology fields that drive our nation's economy. ATE program grantees are expected to ensure that community colleges lead the grant effort, that they meet STEM workforce needs, that STEM faculty teaching and leadership skills and technician education are enhanced, and that they partner with employers and other key stakeholders. The funding levels for the various levels of grants are small grants. Those are for institutions new to the ATE program. Those are generally funded at $200,000 for three years. And new to ATE, let me, let me talk about that just for a little bit. That means no ATE funding in the last 10 years. And a couple of notes. A campus in a multi-campus organization is eligible if that particular campus meets the 10-year test, even if other campuses have received funding. And if you're serving as a PI or co-PI on a project with another organization, uh, you're also eligible provided that your organization is not acting as the host organization for the grant. Another level of funding for the AT program is projects. It's up to $900,000 for three years. And typically areas of uh, interest for the project levels are things like program development, implementation and improvement, professional development, curriculum and educational materials development, and teacher preparation. Those two levels, the small grants and the projects, are where we'll be focusing our efforts. But I do want to just make sure that folks understood that there are centers that can be funded as national centers up to $5 million for four years, regional centers of excellence up to $3 million for four years, and resource centers up to $1.6 million over four years. And one of the final categories is targeted research for technician education that can be funded at $1.2 million for four years. There is a pattern that ATE suggests for funding, and they tend to emphasize this pattern pretty strongly. They'd like to see folks come in uh, as small grantees to begin with, then move to project grants, and if so inclined, move on to a center grant. And I'd like to turn right. it over to Elaine. Thanks, Dennis. Uh, different funding levels usually require different types and extent of evaluation.
One of the things that the NSF program is interested in is impact. What will change as a result of your work? We are interested in effectiveness. How will you know that the things you did with grant funds produced the desired results? Sustainability. Now that's a word that gets used in a lot of ways these days, um, having to do with the environment and all sorts of things. But in the NSF arena, what we're looking at is what do you anticipate will be continued when the grant funding ends? And how will the activity or innovation be sustained? For example, what other sources of funding are possible? What elements of this work can be institutionalized? Also, it's very important that you look at leveraging prior work, lessons learned, and research. Do you know what others have done that is similar to the project you have in mind? Has your work been informed by what others have done and learned? Are you building on previous work to expand what we know about what works and what doesn't work in technician and related STEM education? Have you checked the work and outcomes of other funded projects, especially ATE projects? Have you considered research findings relevant to technician education? Will you apply lessons learned from your own past work? All of these things are very important. And regardless of the funding level, high quality evaluation is going to require that you set clear and specific goals and objectives. So I thought it might be helpful to look at an example. In this example, there is an overarching goal of increasing enrollment and success in the college's civil engineering technology program. This small grant for those new to ATE will focus on recruitment of students who have already enrolled in the college but may not know about the Civil Engineering Technology Program or considered how this major might be a good career path. The program is relatively small and the goal for recruitment gain from the proposed in-reach strategies are reasonably ambitious for this program and are clearly stated. Now, let's look at the activities that are going to support the goal and the stated objective. We want to make sure that the activities are consistent with the objective. So you'll see, I'm going to just let you look at these um, activities that have been proposed. We're going to get some student ambassadors from within the program to help us without, you know, talking to students around the college. We're going to conduct three separate activities. We've decided how many people we're going to target for those activities, where we're going to find those students that we're going to engage in those activities, what the programming might be for those activities, a lot of specifics. And then we're going to ask these uh, students who are already in the program to work with those that we are targeting for the program. With the sample activities outlined here, you will see that the activities are clearly stated for the goal and support the objective. This will tell reviewers of your proposal that you have carefully thought out the plan and it will help in evaluating the activities to determine impact. Now we want to talk a little bit about clearly defined and stated outcomes. So here we're saying that we have set a goal for how many of those that we reach with some of our activities that are actually going to give some thought to this major. Then we're going to see how many that come to one of our Lunch and Learn programs are actually likely to choose the major. And then we're going to see uh, which 15 of those are our best candidates that we can pair up with mentors. Now you can see that we've drilled down even further with metrics 
that can tell us whether or not the activities were successful in achieving the overall enrollment gain goal uh, for the project. Next, we will look at sample evaluation strategies that will help answer the central evaluation question. In other words, we're going to collect evidence to support our claims. You see this is a pretty extensive list. Um, collecting data on participants at events, uh, observing these, uh, the interest of the people that are there, uh, maybe some participant interviews, some surveys may be uh, conducted. We certainly want to talk to our student ambassadors and see what kind of feedback they're getting from the prospective students for the program. Um, and then, uh, what about the new student interviews and feedback? What about the faculty? And, of course, we need some data in terms of enrollment. Baseline fall 2013 data for the number of students in our program so that we can answer the all-important so what question. We will need the fall 2015 and fall 2016 program enrollment data so we can see whether we are on track to achieve our enrollment increase goal. So I think you can see that even one goal and a few activities may require quite a few evaluation activities. By looking at the evaluation questions, what you need to know and how you will capture necessary data and information, you can tell if the scope of work of your project is appropriate for the size of your project. If it seems to be way too much to do, then it probably is. You should go back and look at ways to narrow the scope of the project so that the project is right-sized, so that your evaluation can be right-sized too. Now, uh, Kristen, I'm going to turn it over to you to see if there are any questions from our audience. Great. Thank you, Elaine. We do have a couple questions, and I would um, encourage you to post your questions in the chat box now if you have some. Um, but first of all, um, Dennis, can, Shannon is wondering, she is at a STEM college, and they have a STEM grant. Should they talk about that in their proposal? Yes, they should absolutely talk about it in their proposal. And more than that, they should sort of tie what they're doing with STEM activities in their college to the activities and goals and objectives of the proposal uh, as well. Um, STEM is one of those areas where more specificity is probably uh, more helpful given the fact that there's a lot of activity around STEM and I think NSF wants to know and in what ways will these dollars that we're going to potentially give you improve technician education? Okay, great. Um, Elaine, can you tell us what is the best way to obtain outcome information on past ATE projects? In the, at the National Science Foundation website, nsf.gov, uh, you can search the awards. Um, that site was um, redone um, in the last year or two and uh, has some pretty powerful search um, capabilities now. And so you can go in and look by um, the type of program you're doing, the discipline you're working in, and that sort of thing, so that you can find uh, project summaries for a number of ATE projects in the fields that you're talking about. Okay, great. Good advice. Thank you. Um, Dennis, are there any trends or new directions regarding evaluation occurring in the NSF ATE program now? Uh, I would suggest yes. And I, the last slide that Elaine talked about in terms of evidence to support the claims is something that we're continuing to hear more and more emphasis uh, upon uh, that particular uh, kind of evidence. Um, you said you were going to do some things show us the evidence that says you, in fact, did that. And it's not so much did you do the activities, but did the activities, in fact, create the kind of impact that you wanted it to create? If you did professional development activities, did folks in those activities learn something as a result of those activities? 
and to what degree did they actually put those learnings into practice in their classrooms. So we're hearing and we're seeing much more emphasis placed on uh, providing the evidence that supports the claims that your proposal is making. Okay, great. Um, Elaine, can you tell us how the ATE program defines sustainability? There's really no one definition. Um, it can be a combination of things. Um, first of all, when you when you conduct your project, um, in a sense, some of it may be research. You're trying to find out whether something works or not. So quite frankly, there may be something that you've done that you wouldn't, wouldn't want to sustain because it didn't work. But the things that you find that do work, that do make a difference, that prove to be good and you have the evidence that they're good, um, you want to look at, first of all, whether or not these are items, uh, activities, uh, curriculum, let's say, uh, or teaching methodologies that can be institutionalized. Um, that means that they become a part of the fabric of the institution so that they're being used in classes continuously beyond the life of the grant. Um, or that teaching methodologies, say problem-based learning, for instance, becomes a way that, that many of your teachers continue to teach long beyond uh, the life of the grant. Um, it may be a, a scheduling issue, or maybe it's a new program that you've instituted and it's become permanent in the college and in the college catalog and so forth now. So that, that institutionalizes it. Now the other thing might be something that, that takes money. And so where is that money going to come from? Um, you know, are you going to have sufficient gains in enrollment that would offset the cost of, um, of additional programs? Um, do you have any other way of, of financially supporting something that simply will not go on if it does not have financial resources? So what they're looking for is for you to give some thought to that and to talk about uh, ways that you think that you will be able to sustain or to continue uh, the work of the project that proves worthy of being continued after the grant funding ends. Okay. Thank you so much, Elaine and Dennis. Um, we have one more question, but I'm just going to pose it as more of an anticipation for what's going to come. Uh, Nancy is noting that she and her team are first-time NSF applicants in the stages of answering review questions, and they've hired a review consultant. So does that consultant develop those evaluation questions, or do we do it, or is it a combination of them and the evaluation consultant? So with that, I think I'm going to throw it over to Lori because she's going to be hitting on some of those issues. So Lori. Well, thank you, Kristen. And I, I may hit on some of those issues, but um, since we have a little time since we're gonna, before we get to that question, I would ask Nancy to clarify um, what she means by evaluation questions. I'm not sure she's going to mean what I mean by evaluation questions because she's also talking about review questions. So I think I'm going to need a little more clarification on that item when we get to the question break. Um, but we do want to answer that, so let's not forget about it. So I want to thank uh, Dennis and Elaine and Mentor Connect so much for um, joining us today and for all that great information. And if anybody has any more questions for them, um, that's fine at any point in any of our question breaks. You can throw questions to them as well, and I may ask them for help along the way. Um, so in this uh, section of the webinar, I've given it the title of the whole webinar, um, I want to pick up on Elaine's point about matching the scale of your evaluation to the scale of your project. And she rightly pointed out that if it looks like you're not going to be able to manage evaluating all the important aspects of your project. It could be that you're just trying to tackle too much with your small grant. But what are we really talking about um, when we're talking about evaluation in the ATE context? So I'm sure many of you are familiar with this story, and I've used this in webinars before. Um, here we have a group of blindfolded people inspecting an elephant. You all know this story. And each of them has a limited perspective on this creature, and they come to very different conclusions about, about what it is, because none of them are seeing it in its entirety. And I find evaluation is like that as well. And so I work at, at the Evaluation Center at Western Michigan University, um, obviously, in, in the focus of our resource center is evaluation. So when people hear what I do, they say, oh, you, you do surveys, right? Or you do the course evaluations. So in this version of the cartoon, we're seeing some of the other common things that people equate evaluation with. And yes, it can be 
all of these things, but it's but each of these is just one piece of a much bigger picture. In the field of professional evaluation, the commonly agreed upon definition of evaluation is that it's the systematic determination of something's merit, worth, or significance. Common synonyms for those terms are quality and value and importance. Um, so there's you know key things here. One is that evaluation is systematic. It's not just somebody walking in and giving their opinion. Um, and it's also getting at these deep issues of, of merit, how high quality something is, how good it is, how, how worthwhile it is, did it meet a need. And this is the way that evaluation is really distinct from research. So when we look at evaluation in this big picture, it's really it's about asking important overarching questions about a project's processes and its outcomes. It's about gathering evidence that's going to help answer those questions, interpreting those results to actually answer the questions, and then using the information for accountability, for improvement, and planning. And when you see low quality evaluations, it's typically because one or more of these pieces is missing. For example, you might see a report that's overflowing with data, but those results aren't situated in terms of the questions that are trying to be answered or coming to any larger conclusions from those bits of data, and it just ends up not being very meaningful. So in this webinar, we're focusing on the evaluation of small projects. So what does this mean for small projects? Does it mean because they're small, we get to leave out some of these important ingredients? It definitely does not mean that. In fact, when we think about big versus small evaluations, there really is absolutely no difference between evaluating a small project and evaluating a large project. And of course, I can't hear you on the other end of, of this of my phone, but I can hear these gasps in the audience. Of course, there's a difference. Well, not conceptually, but practically, of course, there are some really quite real differences when you have a big evaluation versus a small evaluation. Namely, you're going to ask smaller questions. And I don't mean they're shorter in length. I mean they're smaller in scope. You're not going to be able to reach answers about or, or be able to assess long-term impacts on a regional economy, for example, which maybe you would do with you know, a $5 million project, but you're not going to do that with a $200,000 project. You might not be able to ask as many evaluation questions as you would with a larger and more complex evaluation. A narrowly focused project calls for a narrowly focused evaluation. And you're probably not going to need as much data. Um, this is due to the scope of the evaluation as well as resource constraints because you're probably also dealing with shorter timelines. Small grants um, for institutions new to ATE are typically for three years, um, while the other types of grants are, are for four and sometimes even longer. And Elaine pointed out to me the other day that the small grants often um, plan their projects for two years, even though they can uh, ask for three years of funding, they often will plan those uh, to, to use the money within two years. So we're even talking about a, t a tighter time frame. And of course, last but not least, uh, small budgets. Small evaluations are going to have smaller budgets. And we're going to be talking more about how to get the most out of your evaluation dollar later in the webinar. So in trying to bring this home, I thought maybe the best way to talk about how to match an evaluation scope to a small project would be to actually walk through um, planning for a small project that, that is a real or was a real ATE project. So I, Elaine mentioned the database of, of um, ATE awards, and that's exactly where I went to find, it, find an example. I searched the publicly available NSF awards database for a completed ATE project. Um, that had received $200,000 or less in funding. And I found this one, and I thought it would be a nice example for our purposes. And you, as you can see, it was funded um, from 2010 to 2012 for not quite $140,000 at Northeast Wisconsin Technical College. Now, I don't know anything about this project or its evaluation other than what I'm going to show you on the next slide. I really just picked it because I thought it would uh, work well for our purposes. So this is almost all of the project abstract um, that I got from the awards database. And I'm going to ask you to take, we're just going to be silent, and I'm just going to ask you to take a couple minutes to read through it, because we're going to be working from this um, text for the next several slides. I'm going to be, just as a heads up, I'm going to be asking you a series of questions and asking you to type your answers in the chat box, and I'll look at those. So it is important that you actually know what we're talking about for the next few slides. So just 
um, take a moment and read through the, the content. So hopefully you've had a chance to get through most of that. So our first question is what is the problem or need being addressed by this project? So just go ahead and based on your reading so far, type a brief answer of what you see as the main need being addressed. So okay, so Max says faculty ability. Uh, Jennifer says the students aren't getting the help they need. The lab is is effective. Yeah, so everybody is honing in right on it. It's pretty clearly stated here, right? The staff members on hand at any one time might not have the expertise needed to help the students. So apparently the students are having trouble using the lab because they don't have all the information they need and the faculty staffing the lab don't know enough to give them the guidance that they need. And there's a clue here as well that there must be a lot of students that aren't being successful in their first attempt for the courses when, when work in this lab is required. I'm going to move on to a next question. I think there's six questions. So our second question is, what are the main project activities? Go ahead and use your chat box again. Most people are saying training, yep, professional development, cross training, training a staff. Yeah, again, it's pretty clearly stated. The project is going to provide cross training for faculty staffing the labs. It also says support and enhancement, but I wasn't quite clear what that might mean. That's definitely not as concrete. Uh, I'm sure that's something that they probably explained in their full project description, but we only have what we see here, so I'm actually just going to focus on the training piece. So we know uh, what the main activity is, so we need to be clear on who the main participant in the activity is. So who is that? Who's the main participant in the main activity? Faculty, instructors, staff of lab, yeah. This isn't hard, right? It's the faculty staff staffing the lab. And what is supposed to be different for those faculty because of the training they're going to get? Okay, so I'm seeing people saying they're going to be trained, they're going to have more knowledge, and then I see some people hitting the nail on the head that they're going to be able to help those students. That's what it's all about. If it just means they're, they're smarter or they know more, that's really not the point of the grant. The point of the grant is that they're going to actually be able to help the students in those labs. And this difference is quite important because it's, as Dennis pointed out, activities is one thing. Provide professional development, we did an activity. That's not the end of the story. Right, so we have to go beyond what we're doing to what difference a project is making. And so that's what we want to hone in here. Oh, I forgot to highlight it there. Yeah, so here we see the key aspects of, of what the difference is for those faculty, what they expected to be different for them. So two more questions. So who ultimately is supposed to benefit from the project? Students, 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 students. Students, students, everyone's getting 100% right, right. Of course, it's students. It should always come down to students or to workers in, in high tech fields when we're thinking about these larger ATE program goals, which all projects are supposed to be 
providing a comp contribution to you. We have one last question. What is going to be different for these students because of the project? Success. Somebody just said number three, right, improve student success, improve retention. That's going a little bit beyond what we see in, 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 the, uh, in the text, but that definitely could be an outcome. Um, right, it's two pieces, improve learning and in, very concretely increasing the percent of students successfully completing the course on their first attempt. There's another bit here, um, improve quality of labs, but again, this is something I wasn't, wasn't as concrete for me, so I didn't highlight it. Well, thanks for doing that. Um, I, you know, you all were great and answered promptly, and I, so I really there weren't tough questions. But the thing is, the answers to these types of questions aren't always obvious for projects, and sometimes it takes a lot of back and forth between an evaluator and a project team to get these kinds of questions answered in concrete terms in ways that can be used to plan and implement the evaluation. But once you do have those answers, you can really move quite faster. In, in effective planning for an evaluation. So if you recall when we looked at those, the main pieces of evaluation, that first, the first step is going to be to figure out what important overarching questions we're going to answer. So I want to think about that. Um, for checking the logic of a project's design and also for helping to plan an evaluation, it's helpful to boil the project's elements down into a simple graphical presentation and these are often called logic models. And what I'm going to show you here is a very elemental logic model. And first, as you can see, I've plugged in the need. Because once we get to the outcomes, we'll want to be able to cross-check the identified need with our intended outcomes, because they better match. Next, we'll look at the activities and who's affected. Um, again, this is an opportunity to check the alignment between what need we're trying to address and the proposed solution. Now at the outcome level, um, and here we're not listing outputs. Sometimes we include outputs, and I'm just trying to keep it simple. But it is important to distinguish between outputs and outcomes. Outputs are those things a project creates from the outcome. Like an output of this, of this project might be um, a training manual for, the, for this lab equipment. Or we could count an output as the number of faculty trained. But for outcomes, this is really about the difference we're making in relation to the problem that we were intending to address. So the first outcome we have here is that faculty are going to be able to help the students in the lab. But it's not about the faculty ability, right? So we have to keep going a little further. Ultimately, the project is supposed to lead to students learning more in these courses and performing better in these courses. So overall, this exercise worked out pretty well for this project, the need, the activities, and the outcomes are all pretty clearly and logically linked. But as I said before, sometimes when you do this, it can reveal real gaps or unreasonable leaps, let's say, in a, in a project's logic. And when that happens, it's time to go back to the project design or its goals. Um, this one worked out well, but we can move on. So we can move on to developing our evaluation questions. But again, sometimes, and um, Nancy mentioned being in that review process. So sometimes, you know, they, an NSF might want to fund a project, but just like feel like maybe those goals were a little too lofty, or there wasn't good, a good match between the need being addressed and, and the activities that were being proposed. So this is a way to kind of boil it down and take a good look at what's going on. And this is very important for planning and evaluation. This worked pretty well for this project, so we can go ahead and come up with our evaluation questions. I'm going to drop the needs off because we did establish there was a good linkage between the needs and the outcomes, so we're not going to worry about those anymore. It is important when we're thinking about evaluation questions, and these are the big questions about a project, um, to look at both the process and the outcomes, or the activities and the outcomes. So first we'll look at the activities. We might ask, to what extent did the training meet the needs of faculty? This is important because if it wasn't what they needed, and I'm not talking about what they wanted, but what they needed, we don't have much chance of bringing about the intended outcomes. So we need to look at this. Next, we can look at the first level of outcomes. We can ask, to what extent did the training improve the faculty's competence with the lab equipment, or something like that. 
Again, if we didn't see results in their improved ability, it's unlikely we're going to get to those positive impacts for students. At the next level of outcomes, we'll ask to what extent did the training improve students or result in an improvement in student performance in lab-related courses? So that's a nice set of three evaluation questions. It's completely manageable for this size project. Next, we need to figure out what our evidence will be for answering those questions. Dennis mentioned uh, this you know, kind of growing attention to evidence and what counts as evidence. So basically here, we need to match our data to the questions. So here's our first evaluation question. Um, to what ex well, you already know that. We've already read that. So I came up with two in possible indicators here. Um, first, we could look at if faculty are self-reporting that they were satisfied with the training, that it was relevant to their needs, that they were engaged, and so forth. These are typical things we look at in professional development. And to do that, we would probably do the typical thing, which is either survey or interview participating faculty immediately following the training. And I'll point out um, here, when you're thinking about cost, that a survey is going to be much less expensive than an interview, especially a web-based survey. Um, it's very straightforward to analyze this kind of quantitative data, but you can also add a few open-ended items so you're also getting the qualitative data. It just is just more labor intensive to do um, like a focus group or an interview. Um, it would be important as well to look at the degree to which the training actually addressed all the lab equipment that the faculty need to know about. This seems very basic, but this is the kind of thing that can be easily overlooked, uh, and it would be important in terms of evaluating the process. And here, uh, it could simply be a review of the training content, or we could, the evaluator could simply you know, sit down with the PI and, and just make sure that everything um, that's covered is needing to be covered. And this wouldn't actually be a big part of the evaluation, but it would, could provide important formative feedback to make sure the, tra the training's on track. So the second question, we're looking at how well the training improved the faculty's competence with the lab equipment. And here I identified four possible indicators. Again, this is just kind of standard practice. We could ask the faculty to self-report their learning. This could be done um, as uh, you know, a pre and a post or just a post uh, survey kind of thing. Um, we could do that immediately following the training. Uh, it, when we get the re immediate reaction data or do it as a follow-up. We would want to look at the percentage of the intended audience actually participated. Again, a key thing for in, the, in the project description was that all the faculty staff in the lab have the competence they need to help the students. So we need to make sure we reach that audience. And hopefully the project is keeping good records of who's participating, and we will be able to check that. It would be important to know that the participants are actually have the ability, um, the knowledge and skills they need to provide the students the guidance that they need. And we could embed, to do that, we can embed performance tasks into the training itself to make sure that the, they're gaining the, the knowledge and skills necessary. And finally, we could um, assess student satisfaction with the help they're getting in the labs. And we could do this, for example, by exit surveys or interviews with the students who've been in the labs. And we just have that one more question. Um, and this was about improving student performance in the lab-related courses. And here I thought the in three indicators um, could be used. The student grades on assignments that require lab work, um, grades for the courses overall. And then importantly, looking at that, that was mentioned as one of the specific goals, looking at the percentage of students who are passing these courses on the first attempt. And for these, we're going to need faculty cooperation to get uh, this sort of data um, for the evaluation. And it's going to be helpful as well as we, if we can get some data from our institutional research office. So as a, as a project team works with an evaluator or um, to you know, plan an evaluation, come up with these good questions to ask, um, it would be, make a lot of sense to go back to what, how the initial problem was identified. There must have been some manifestation that there was a problem with, in the lab. So what was happening that they knew you know, that that was the problem we want to, and so what was the evidence they had to even know that there was a need for this project. So we want to go back to, to what those observations were and see if there's been a change uh, in similar observations since then. 
So I'm thinking about these four key pieces of any evaluation, the big picture of evaluation. We've pretty much dealt with the first two with regard to asking questions and gathering evidence. So let's consider interpretation. Elaine gave a lot of a lot of great examples of how to write very specific objectives. Um, and we could use those uh, to what I'm calling targets here for what we're trying to achieve. And I just made these up completely. You know, it would really depend on the context and how severe the problem was and where they where this college thinks it needs to be. So these are just made up. Um, but I so I plugged in some targets here saying that 75% of the students will achieve a, a grade of C or better on all assignments that 75% or more of students will achieve a grade of C or more on, on the course. And um, looking, thinking about that percentage of who's passing on their first attempt, let's say the baseline was 50 and we want to get it up to 75. Those not, may not be ambitious enough. It does, that, the point doesn't really matter. It's about um, having those targets to aid in the interpretation. Because Having those targets, it's going, that's what's going to enable us to answer those questions. Instead of just spitting back the data points, we can actually bring meaning to the data points around, um, give meaning to the evidence that we gather. So next, we need to think about how we're going to use that information. And I've identified three uses, right? Accountability, improvement, and planning. So let's briefly look at those. Basically, accountability is demonstrating to NSF that you did what you said you would do with the grant money. And your evaluation goes a step further, of course, and shows um, what happened as a result of the investment. So you did what you said you were going to do, so what? Um, and you would include your evaluation results in your annual, annual report to NSF. This is your key accountability exercise, uh, is sending, you know, submitting a report annually to NSF. To use the results for improving a project, you want to keep track of what the results are as they're coming in to determine if changes are needed in implementation. For example, if the, if the feedback from the training sessions um, is showing that there are some problems with that training, then they can be addressed right away. You don't want to find out a year later that something was going really wrong in those training sessions with faculty. And planning, it's never too early to start thinking about your next steps. Um, and you, you can use your evaluation results to determine you know, what worked and what didn't as you plan your next project. And you'll need to summarize those outcomes as well as the lessons learned possibly um, in your next proposal. And there's a, you know, a section you have up to five pages to talk about results from your prior NSF support. So you really want to have something to show um, with the money you've gotten in the past. That doesn't mean you have to have been, uh, you know, wildly successful. It means to show you made an earnest effort. You did what you said you were going to do. If it didn't have the results that you hoped, you know, hopefully through the evaluation, you you know why and what went wrong and what you're going to do differently the next time. So when we zoom back out to this big picture, we've gone through pretty much each of these you know, pieces of an evaluation with our example project. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Kristen now. I don't want to forget about the question that was posed before the break. Um, and also, so of course, if you have any questions for me, that's great. Or if you have any more questions you'd like to pose to Elaine or Dennis, you can do that as well. Lori, we do have a lot of questions. Um, if you want to go back to the original question after the first section, which was asking about does the consultant develop the evaluation questions or is it a combination? Um, that question still stands, but within that, there's also some talk about internal and external evaluators. So um, they're asking, wouldn't using an evaluator to help establish the goals of the project present some of the back and forth needed for clarity? We'll start there. Do you think that an evaluator should help to establish the goals of the project? I think an evaluator often has a very useful perspective on that. Um, it's just the only reason I hesitate with that is you really don't want your evaluator getting into designing your project and kind of taking ownership of your project. But what an evaluator can do, whether they know anything about the content area or not, um, is look at things from you know, a, logical, a logical perspective. Do the 
activities match up with the intended outcomes? Are they shooting too far? Are things too vague? Um, you know, just evaluators, you know, depending on their area of expertise and their experience, have, some of them have seen quite a lot of different projects and seen what works and what doesn't. So they can provide valuable insight. So I, I think that's um, perfectly fine uh, for that, especially with um, people who are sort of new to this territory and writing proposals and writing goals and objectives and evaluation and questions and so forth. I think an evaluator can be, have a valuable, um, can make a valuable contribution in that regard. Okay. And um, they're wondering also, does NSF have a preference with regard to external versus internal evaluators or evaluations? Well, I think that question is going to be answered pretty soon, so I'll take a pass on that, and they can bring okay. it up if it's not sufficiently answered later. Great. And um, there's a question about why wouldn't you assess pre and post faculty competence on equipment? And keeping that question in mind, I'll just um, read a short um, comment that was also given that says, in short projects like these, there is often a problem with measuring change that requires pre and post intervention data collection. However, collecting pre-intervention data can often take substantial time that stalls implementation. For example, data from courses or activities that only occur once per year. Any tips or tricks to deal with this problem for these projects that only last a couple of years? So maybe you can take those two together. Yes. and I'm may have lost the first one and focusing on the second one. So I'm in, in terms of baseline pre and post, and I totally agree, uh, especially for a small project. Um, you're probably not going to have the luxury of that. Not to mention you're going to probably have different faculty coming in and out. Um, so I would go back to this. Like, there was a reason this particular project was proposed. Somebody noticed a problem somewhere. They weren't just, you know, sitting in their office thinking, you know what we should do? We should have this training. You know, there was a problem. Maybe students were complaining. Maybe they, students were turning in assignments that weren't, you know, sufficient and they are complaining that they couldn't use the lab equipment because the staff member couldn't help them. I mean, there was, there was some manifestation, manifestation of a problem. So we go back to what that was. What, were, what was occurring? Um, and we can, you can ask faculty. I mean, it's okay to just ask, have you seen a difference? You know, that's qualitative data. It's perfectly fine. Um, you can also do what's called um, a retrospective pre-post where you don't have it set up where, you know, you're getting the data before an event intervention and then after, but you're asking participants to reflect back before, you know, they got whatever they got and then now. And that you can, I mean, you can look up studies on this to see about the validity. Sometimes a retrospective pre-post is actually more valid because people didn't realize how that they didn't know what they didn't know before, you know, and so when they can do it at the same time, what I knew then, what I know now, that can be very effective. There's a book by, um, Kristen, you might need to help me out. I just got it. What is it? Real World Evaluation? I think, it, is that the title? Yes. Jane Davidson? No. Sure. Real World. Oh, I think it's I'm sorry. Bamberger. Um, anyway, oh, yes. it'll be in our handout. We're going to send a handout. It's going to be in there. But it's all about ways to, if you really wanted to do a, an experimental design, which you couldn't because you didn't have enough time, enough money, uh, the timing wasn't right, and so forth, a bunch of strategies for, um, a bunch of alternative strategies for that. So I would recommend that book as well. I'm going to stop talking about that question. Let's take another one. Okay. Um, there's there's more questions about if you're required to have a third party evaluator for a small $200,000 grant, which I think you're getting to in a few minutes. Um, so I think at this point, Lori, why don't we go ahead and move into the next section? And um, you can answer some of these questions that are being posed, and I'll also sift through them as we're working. Yeah, I think we are going to get to that uh, issue. So thank you all for the great questions. Um, so we've looked at a real small ATE project and how we would align the evaluation um, so it's properly matched to the size of the project. In this segment of the webinar, we're going to look at evaluation in ATE more generally. It's important to keep in mind the overall ATE program goals. It's about producing more qualified technicians and improving the technical skills and the academic preparation of technicians and their teachers. 
But keep in mind, it is not your job, it's not the job of your small ATE project to take on these big goals. It's your project's job to make a contribution to advancing these goals. And therefore, it's your evaluation's job to determine the quality, the value, the importance, we could say merit worth significance of your contribution. Um, this is just a caution here not to write overly lofty goals or promise an overly ambitious evaluation. Your project is one piece of a $60 million a year puzzle that is ATE. And just to keep your perspective what your piece of that is and to keep your goals properly scoped and your, your evaluation properly scoped. You have to keep perspective on what you can reasonably achieve with a small grant and what your evaluation can do with limited resources. So a question we get a lot at Evaluate and we actually used to ask ourselves is, what does NSF want to see in a project evaluation? But there is an assumption here that there is one NSF perspective, one NSF voice, and the fact is there simply isn't. Uh, NSF is proudly non-prescriptive about project evaluation. That is my perception. Um, so you should be, I think you should be skeptical if you ever get a simple answer to this question. What does NSF want to see in a project evaluation? You're much better off asking your program officer. And this is a picture of Elizabeth Tellis. This is on our National Visiting Committee. And I know she's the program officer for many of the smaller grants, probably not all of them. If you're not sure who your program officer is, you should definitely find out. Your program officer is the one who's responsible for approving your annual report each year. So it's really that person's perspective and opinion that really matters. And if you are concerned and curious or confused, about what you should be doing for evaluation, I would say that should be uh, your first stop. And anyone with NSF funding should check out the NSF uh, user-friendly guide to project evaluation. This was is an NSF publication, so it's pretty much the you know statement about evaluation. There's also you can find it here on our website, but also uh, we'll provide a link on our handout that we'll send out. And whether you've, you're already funded or not, you should definitely give the ATE program solicitation a close read for cues and clues about what's expected from NSF project evaluations. I think it's quite noteworthy that the ATE program has, they ha there's a small set of additional intellectual merit criteria as well as for broader impacts. Um, those, of course, are the main re review criteria for NSF, but there's a few specific ones for ATE. And this one that you see on the screen is obviously specifically about evaluation. I think this is very, you know, indicative that evaluation is important to the ATE program. Um, and I think, you know, this, this emphasis on is the, going to provide useful information, that's really what should drive your evaluation. It should produce information that the project team finds useful and that the project team can use. Uh, to improve what they're doing, as well as to share the, their lessons learned, disseminate what they're doing to others. Which brings me to one of my favorite quotes from the evaluation literature, which is by my former boss, Daniel Stuffelbean, which is, the most important purpose of evaluation is not to prove, but to improve. So keep that in mind. So let's get back to the solicitation. This is an excerpt um, from the section on curriculum and educational materials development projects. And we can read through the statement, or, or in any of these, and get some clues for how evaluation should be focused. For example, here we see one more, um, that NSF wants to see the evaluation demonstrate the impact of the project on many students and faculty. So we, so we know right away we need to look at the reach of this curriculum, you know, who's it reached, who's using it, and with what results. That's probably beyond the scope of a small ATE project, but let's look at what else it says anyway. It should include measures of student learning. Um, again, as an evaluator, this is going to be a cue for me that I'm going to need to work closely with the faculty to be able to get those kinds of data. Another hint at the bottom here is that it should include input from employers. Um, and this could be part of the development process, which would be formative evaluation. And that would probably be more useful than when it's already completed and disseminated and then getting information from or feedback from employers. So next, let, let's look at um, professional development projects. 
Here it indicates that the project should, or the evaluation, should demonstrate use in classrooms and sustainable changes in, in practice of faculty. So we're clearly going to need more than immediate reaction data from any sort of training session that we have with faculty and actually look at how they're implementing it as well as, as we see here, the changes um, that are occurring in student learning outcomes and the student, as well as the students' perceptions of technical careers. It's really important to get that immediate feedback. Um, it's just not, it just doesn't go far enough. The guidance with regard to uh, program improvement and development projects, which is another one of the main tracks in the ATE program, is much more sparse. So I'll just draw your attention to one word here, evidence, again, sort of underscoring what Dennis was talking about uh, earlier. So evidence, you know, it's going to be more than people's opinions. It's going to be more than number crunching. Um, it's it's going to require drawing on multiple sorts of data from multiple sources to build a case. Um, about a project and the impact that it's made and the, and the quality with which it was implemented. But wait, because there is a new solicitation coming out uh, for proposals this year, so you're going to have to do your own detective work to figure out, um, you know, for a little, from those clues on how to focus your evaluation and the kinds of evidence that are going to needed for each, for the type of project that you're going to be proposing. So that was kind of a quick section, so I am ready to take more questions. Great. You know, we only had one really specific question, and that is, when is the solic solicitation coming out, Lori? Well, I don't have any inside information on that, so I cannot. What? And I, I, we just had our National Visiting Committee meeting and had an NSF person there, and she didn't have a concrete date either, so I do not know. Keep okay. your eyes out. Yes. Um, well, why don't we go ahead and move on. We don't have any other specific questions to this short um, section, so um, I know that a lot of the information you're going to present in this last section will answer the questions that people were asking earlier. So we'll move okay. ahead. I think that's a good idea. So everybody needs to do more with less these days, right? So in this, this section, I'm going to share some ideas for getting the most for your evaluation dollar, and I would encourage um, all the participants, if they have um, some suggestions, to go ahead and, and type those in as well and share with the other, the rest of the group. Well, first, I would encourage you to think about your evaluation budget in terms of how much do we need to invest in evaluation to ensure it brings value to our project. This is a different orientation to thinking about how much do I have to spend on evaluation. So you want to go look at it in terms of an investment, and it should bring value to your project. If you make too small of an investment, it's going to yield a minimal return. If it's too big, if it's way out of proportion to your project, it's going to drain resources away from implementation, which is definitely not what you want. Finally, if you hit that balance and it's just right, evalu evaluation should add value to your work. Now, getting to this question of do you need to have an external evaluator, the ATE, this is an excerpt from the ATE solicitation again, clearly states that the funds to support an evaluator independent of the project or center must be requested. So I take that as a very clear answer of yes to the question of do you need to have an external person. Um, but that doesn't answer the question, what makes somebody, what does that mean? What's, what's, what's independent? Um, so again, this is an area where I would, if you have other things you think should be considered and what makes somebody independent, please add them in your chat box. This is what I, I thought of. I, definitely the person should not have any other roles on the project. Um, you know, like a lot of times a project manager kind of person will do some of the functions of an internal evaluator and we'll talk about internal evaluators and that's fine, but that's not going to count as somebody that's independent of your project, clearly. It shouldn't be someone that's supervised by someone who works on the project. Um, again, that just puts that evaluation, evaluator person in an awkward role if they're evaluating the work of a, their supervisor. And also they should have no financial 
or intellectual stake in the project's process. Now, in fact, this is almost impossible to achieve because anytime you pay somebody as an external evaluator, that person now has a vested interest in your success because they want you to succeed, they want you to go for more funding, and they want you to continue as uh, they want to continue as your evaluator. But you know, so that's sort of a given. But beyond that, you know, like if a, for example, some maybe somebody develops a training program for faculty and it's proprietary. That would not, and you're going to use that that curriculum. That would not be who you want to have as an evaluator. That would not be seen as independent. But still, there are degrees of externality and independence. Oh, I wanted. To, sorry, I meant to say this picture. So this is me, and this is our evaluator, Lana Rux, at the 2011 ATEPI conference. And I thought this was a good picture to show because this is where I met our external evaluator. I we were sitting here at this breakfast roundtable, and I was just really impressed, you know, the way with her, and I, we had very common ideas about evaluation, and we kind of struck up a professional relationship, and then when I needed an evaluator, um, she was the, the number one on my list. But we had no prior relationship before this, this situation. I think you know, that's kind of an ideal scenario where you really bring in somebody with an independent perspective and expertise in evaluation. Okay, so thinking about degrees of independence, um, when we do the annual survey of all ATE grantees, when we ask a about three types of evaluators. Um, internal to the project, so that would be, for example, like a project manager person who also plays a role in gathering and analyzing some internal data. Um, the person could be external to the project, but internal to the institution. And that, for example, might be someone in an institutional research office, or you know, you're in you know, biotechnology, and there's a professor in sociology who's done a lot of evaluation work. That would be an example of external to the project, and, but internal to the institution. Or you could have a scenario where uh, the evaluator is both. And this is, this is the most common scenario. This is our scenario. So they have no relationship, no role in our project, and no um, employment at our institution. So the thing is, you must have an external evaluator, one of these two kinds. Now, if you use this kind internal to the institution, it will be important in your proposal to explain the independence if you're at the same institution of how there, you know, the there are, you know, the role of one isn't impacted by the other. Just to explain that and to confirm that there is independence there. Maybe even include a statement from that from each of the units clarifying that independence. But you can also have an internal evaluator, and we're going to talk about leveraging internal and external evaluation in a little bit. So this is the breakdown in the ATE program. Um, almost everybody has an evaluator, 94% of some sort. Most grants, 77%, have that scenario where the, the evaluator is external to both the project and the institution. A small percentage has both internal and external evaluation. An even smaller number has that situation where you're internal to the institution but external to the, the immediate project, and then very few um, have an internal evaluator only. So you definitely would be in a very small minority if you try to move forward with a project with only an internal evaluator. So this is the, the scenario where, where most ATE projects are. So this is that same quote. Now I just want to bring your attention to another part of it, that the requested funds must match the scope of the proposed evaluative activities. Everybody wants to know how much does evaluation cost? Well, I can't tell you that exactly, but I can tell you some clues, okay? So on average, according to data reported on the annual survey, ATE projects allocate about 8% of their broad budgets to evaluation. And when we look at this in terms of actual dollars for projects of $200,000 or less, the median expenditure is $5,000 a year. This is not a lot. So the next question we get is how much do evaluators get paid? Well, this is like a lot of professions where it's going to vary quite a lot. Um, just from my own person, this is, I mean, this isn't 
this is my own personal knowledge here. Our doctoral students get paid $25 an hour, so that comes out to $200 a day. And I know some very, you know, well-known and experienced evaluators are charging, you know, $2,000 a day, maybe even more. So I try to get a, a firmer handle on this. So oops. Um, I looked up on the AAUP, no, the Chronicle of Education website for the average daily rate of a U.S. associate professor just as some sort of benchmark to work with. So if you went with you know, a person of that caliber, that's going to come out. If you have a $15,000 total budget for evaluation and the person makes $640 a day, that's going to come out to a total of 23 days of their time, which isn't, you know, that's not even counting travel or other costs. That's the, if you were only paying for their time. And that comes out to just eight days a year. So you're really going to want to maximize what you can do internally, I think. So here I have, I'm going to present four strategies for to save money in evaluation. The first is uh, develop your own tracking system to monitor who you're reaching. I'll talk about each of these a little more in detail. Um, secondly, maintain a record, a really good record, and keep it up to date of key project activities and accomplishments. Use your institutional research data to the full extent possible. I'm going to ask Elaine to say a bit more about this when we get to the question break. And then leveraging internal and external evaluation to, again, it's important to focus on the most important questions, not anything you could possibly ask about a project, but the most important ones. And I want to point out these first two are really about keeping good records. Having good accountability, good record keeping, good documentation is going to take your evaluation pretty far in and of itself. So what do I mean by this tracking system? It's not implanting a chip in your students. Um, you're going to keep a, or we keep a spreadsheet, exactly a database, um, but you could use either a spreadsheet or a database to keep a log of who, who participated, including their key demographics, their contact information, and the nature of their involvement in the project. And I'll just show you briefly how we use that information. So we track who uh, participates with us in our workshops and webinars and so forth. And what's really um, was so surprising about this is that our largest uh, portion of our audience is college administrators. This would include grant writers and grants managers and so forth. This was an, an audience we were expecting to reach. So it's, it's really helpful for us to know this, not only to tailor what we're offering, but also can show this was an unexpected um, result of our work. We're having a broader impact than we than we intended to, and then just the further breakdown. So we can use this formatively. Um, you know, why why are more PIs not coming? Why are we getting more administrators than PIs? And then you know, who are these? Why are these people coming with no ATE role? That's wonderful. We're again attracting a broader audience. So we can use this information for our accountability and reporting. You know, very concretely who we're reaching and in what proportions. We can also use it formatively. Who are we not reaching as much as, as we'd hoped? Um, who are we reaching that we weren't expected? And, and what do they need differently than what, what we planned on? And this is just another chart based on the same data in terms of how frequently people are coming um, to our activities. So this is great. We can report to NSF. We have, well now with this webinar, over 900 people who actively participate in a workshop or webinar. That's what we can, you know, for accountability. But we can also look at, okay, what can we do to get more of these people to come back who's only coming to um, one event? I should have explained that. So this is how many events people have come to, and then the number of people. So 545 people have come to one event. So that leaves you know over 300 who've come to more than that. But and again, it's just we keep really good records, and we can make a lot of use of the information. And this kind of data is going to need to be reported in your annual report to NSF. And we also will, you can probably draw on it for the AT annual survey, which is going on right now. And if you haven't done it, please do. So secondly, keeping a record of key project activities and accomplishments. This may seem really simple, but it's easy to forget this when you get busy launching your projects. So I mean, if you're on the project side of things, just this is just something that's important to do. And if you're on the evaluator side, you know, encourage the, the project team to keep track of this information because it's going to help them and it's going to help the external evaluator when it comes time for them to talk about process, to talk about results. So this is a, 
And what we do at Evaluate, what we call ours a Vita, and it's 11 pages long at this point because we've been in business for about six years. But it's succinct documentation of your past performance and your capacity for future work. So just like a resume for an individual, um, you know, it's a it's a succinct statement. It's concrete. Uh, you don't need a lot of fluffy narratives. It's like this is what we've done. On ours, we define our our mission. Our goals are funding, and this can be good if you're, especially if you're getting funding from other sources other than NSF to show how you're um, leveraging resources. We show our staffing levels, which I think is good to kind of put things in perspective about what you're able to do with what kind of staffing level. And we list all of our activities and deliverables. And I think very importantly, we list all the personnel involved. Now, this would include, of course, our paid staff, but also people from all over the ATE community who worked with us as consultants. And collaborators, and it really shows. You know, we've worked with I think more than 50 different ATE projects and centers now, so it shows we're really working in the community. Now, this is going to be different depending on the focus of your project, but again, it's just a succinct statement of of what you're doing, and it really it puts a lot of information you're going to need um, for your NSF annual report right at your fingertips. So, using institutional research data to the fullest extent possible. Common elements you might be able to get from an institutional research office are, you know, if you can get to the individual student level their um, student ID and you can track over time um, their demographic information, their program of study, um, whether they're staying in from semester to semester and where they're graduating. And if you can track this over time, it's great. You might even be able to create you know, a comparison group. Now the point here is you really want to make friends with your institutional research person as soon as possible and find out how requests should be submitted and when. So what kind of what are their parameters that they need to be able to draw down the data so that it's useful for you. And when we get to a question break in just a moment, I'm going to ask Elaine to pick up on this that thread. So finally, this idea of um, leveraging internal and external evaluation. There's no one way to do this. So I'm just going to throw out some some different ways um, this might look. And, but it's really about combining the internal and the external piece for a cohesive evaluation that's going to provide the project you know, real-time useful information they can use right away, as well as that sort of high level outcome assessment, accountability uh, kinds of information that NSF needs. So one way uh, to look at this is sort of the evaluator as a coach. So the external evaluator who's got the expertise in evaluation or and maybe even the content area is going to provide regular guidance and feedback to a project team throughout a project, making sure they're on course, helping them make adjustments where necessary, giving regular feedback, you know, really helping them to develop their capacity as they go on, going along, but always kind of having a bit of an external perspective. Then the evaluator as the heavy lifter. So this is where the evaluator is really going to do all the more advanced things when it comes to evaluation. You know, designing the instruments, planning the overall evaluation. You know, we went through the exercise of matching data to questions and so forth, analyzing the results and writing the report. And maybe the pro all the project team can do is is contribute by actually being the people on the ground collecting the data and providing that data to the evaluator. Then evaluator is architect, so really sort of front loading the evaluation with uh, sort of intensive design of the evaluation, design of the data collection instruments, planning how things will be analyzed, doing all that work up front, and then having the project team execute it, maybe you know checking in periodically to make sure things are staying on course and being done correctly and serving as an advisor, but not being so much of the hands-on. But again, still having that external person's role, their perspective, their sort of stamp of approval on what the evaluation is doing internally. And then the divide and conquer, which is what I would say that our approach is to combining internal and external evaluation. So um, we, on our, for our project, and yeah, it's different because we are evaluators, but we are kind of responsible for keeping track and assessing how well we're reaching our target audience, how deeply they're participating and engaging with this, and what those immediate outcomes are. You're going to be asked to do a survey at the end of this webinar, and I know you will all do it 100%. You're so great. 
Um, so we're responsible for that, and we'll analyze it and we'll share it. You know, summarize it, not so much analyze it, but run the descriptive statistics and and share that with our external evaluator. And and our external evaluator is more responsible for looking at those long-term outcomes, the deeper impacts that really needs an external perspective um, to do. So, kind of to close up this part, I just want to walk through how we combine internal and external evaluation at Evaluate, because I think it's a model that a lot um, of people can use even if they don't have the, maybe necessarily the amount of experience that we do in evaluation. So I want to think about this in terms of our webinars in particular, since you're all familiar with our webinars. So when we go to um, prepare for a webinar, we'll sit down together and view the recording of our last webinar that we did on uh, maybe a similar topic or just the most recent webinar. And we're going to look at the results of the survey that participants did at the end of our uh, a similar webinar or our most recent webinar. And we're going to use that information to revise our strategy and our content for this upcoming webinar based on what we saw as our strengths and weaknesses. We're going to debrief about that and re record no, we're going to do our webinar, and then right after that, we're going to debrief about it and think, okay, what went well, what didn't go well, what are we going to do differently? This is all formative evaluation, formative internal evaluation. And so you're going to do the survey at the end of the webinar, um, and then almost we'll keep that open for probably about a week, um, and we'll send you the link with our handout as well. And then we're going to look at that, and we're going to use that information to inform our ongoing work. But it doesn't end there. Um, our external evaluator annually is going to gather data um, from our entire audience, not just webinar participants, but get, gather information about their perceptions of the overall quality and utility of our work and our, and our webinars and other resources, the extent to which they use the resources, I should say you use our resources, and how our work has impacted your evaluation practice in your project work. And so we'll and share her report and our uh, results with our, the NSF and our National Visiting Committee. Um, so we're really integrating those to provide a comprehensive picture. So you can see this is sort of a mixture of inform, informal, informal, um, formative and summative evaluation and sort of highlighting here that internal and external combined. So that's how we do it. Um, and so there's lots of ways, and I hope you'll share your uh, suggestions and experiences about how maybe you've combined external and internal or been able to save money uh, in your evaluation work. But I think we'll go to questions now. Great. Thanks, Lori. Um, we do have a couple questions. First, there's a question asking if there are guidelines from NSF for selecting an external evaluator. Um, there aren't, and in fact, I feel like that's on our plate because people keep asking us that. And, and we have covered that um, in other webinars more, and so if you go to our events, I think in our last webinar from August 2013, that was, on, I mean, our last webinar on proposals, we get into that a bit, and I have a little bit in that in a checklist on proposal development. But is there any, you know, a single NSF document saying what to look for an evaluator? There isn't. And, I, you know, I'll admit it's tricky because there is no certification. There's no particular degree evaluators are required to have. Um, you really have to do a fair amount of legwork to look at their prior work, get references, and see if they have the expertise that you need, um, that they're going to be able to attend to you to the degree that you need, and it's a good fit. Okay, great. Um, Mel is wondering, who does the evaluator have to sell the evaluation to, or in other words, convince that it was competent and well done? He's wondering, if, if is that the PO? Um, well, first of all, okay, so the, the evaluator, first and foremost, works for the project PI, meaning, is the, you know, the PI is the evaluator's client um, and needs to meet their expectations for what's delivered and the level of quality with which it's delivered. Now, it could happen where a, it meets the expectations of the PI and is submitted to the NSF program officer, and it and it's you know you get feedback saying this isn't rigorous enough or it's not properly focused or you know it's just not enough data or something like that. That could happen. 
And that's why I would suggest kind of heading that off proactively and talking to the program officer in advance about what their expectations are for evaluation. But in terms of who it has, uh, uh, you know, I think first the, it has to meet the client's expectations, the PI's expectations and needs, um, but then the next level of review would be the program officer. Okay, thank you so much, Lori. Um, we would like to now take just a minute to introduce an ATE project that is working on formative assessment systems for ATE. It's um, called FAST for ATE, and they're helping ATE PIs to develop useful evaluation frameworks for project improvement. Uh, the project leaders would like to extend an invitation to ATE PIs and evaluators who are interested in further developing their evaluation framework and can commit to a one-day workshop scheduled to co coincide with the 2014 ATE conference this fall. So specifically, um, excuse me, they are looking for participants who will have the opportunity to develop logic models and evaluation models to, um, for their programs, identify real-time data sources, plan for data collection systems, and interact with colleagues working in the same program areas. So if you are interested, that you can go to our website and navigate to the events page where you will find an application. Our next webinar in May is going to be presented by SAS for ATE. So anyone who is chosen to participate will be um, committed to that webinar, but it's also open to everyone to, um, to sign up and attend. So please also visit our website where you can learn more about our events, search our resource library, use our evaluator directory, and download our quarterly newsletters and access information from all of our past webinars. And I'm going to, um, now we're going to put up the webinar survey, so Mike, if you can go ahead and do that. And of course, as Lori mentioned it a few times, it comes as no surprise that evaluation is really important to us here at Evaluate, so we'd really like your feedback. It will only take a few minutes for you to do so. Um, you should see the screen now. So go ahead and, um, and start in on it when you're ready. We'll leave the survey open. Moderators, remember not to close your survey window on your screen. And while you're working on the survey, we'd like to thank you for your participation in today's webinar. And Lori, Elaine, Dennis, thank you so much as well for sharing your wisdom with us today. On behalf of our Evaluate team, um, thank you and have a really great day.